you want to share the note well, we can get that out of the way while you try to get the other ones. Right, right, right. right. Um, So you can talk to it. I'm just going to send this. Um, hi, everybody. This is the uh, uh, the LSR Working Group first interim of 2020. This is the note well slide that we all need to read and understand. Primarily what it's saying is that by participating in this meeting, just like a normal face-to-face -face meeting, uh, you agree to follow the ITF process and policies. All those other things that it lists there on your screen, if you're aware of contributions covered by patents, or patent applications, must disclose this fact, or not participate in the discussion. Uh, sorry, this is Alvaro. Um, can you make your screen bigger, or maybe it's AC's screen? It's AC's. Okay, I can in a second here. He's trying to find that. I'm I'm stalling. Oh, okay, I can. I can do that, but is that better? No, not really. Um, you're gonna. Are you gonna share the PDFs directly? I was, yeah, but that's going to be, I'm going to go full screen. That, that'll be better then. Uh, Font bigger, please. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's two solutions to this. You either share the document or, which is probably the best for the slide presentations. Right, right, right. Or, or change the font size, but you also could just change your screen size. To the I get out of full screen here. here. Remember? Uh, no. Maybe just up to the, if you take Did your you say, how do you get out of full screen? Yes. What sequence? Uh, mouse up to the top of the screen. It'll reveal the menu bar and you can click on the little green jelly bean again. Oh, yeah, there it is. Okay. 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 I think I think I'm ready to go now. Uh, you'll notice that we don't have any uh, uh, status on document status. We we're gonna. I, I did some slides, and I'm gonna defer that. At first, we we're gonna only have one session, and we're gonna try and fit it all in one session. We thought we just skip the document status, but now that we have two, we'll, we'll do it at the second during the second uh, session. The first one is uh, flex algorithm. That's Peter Senek. Is Peter on? Yeah. Okay. Hi, folks. I thought this would be better than two computers, but it, I may have uh, overestimated ability to, to navigate to. Okay. So I, I can share. I can share the document from my computer. If that helps. I, don't know. I see. Okay. If anybody's okay, I can. I'll. I'll give you the ball then. That would be probably be is easier. Um, I, just to remind everybody to go to the ethernet and sign the blue sheet. And also, if you're not presenting, then please mute. AC, can you pass me the ball, please? I am going to. I can do this. Huh? 
it should have it now. <sighs> no, doesn't seem like. Got it. Really? Can you guys see what I share? Yep. We can now. Uh, okay, let me try. All right. So, hi right, folks, welcome. Hope you're all safe. Doing reasonably well, considering the situation. Uh, this is a quick update to the Flex Algo draft. So there has been two changes to the draft. We added one more constraint, which is uh, an exclude SRLG constraint. This is a new constraint added to the flex algo definition. It allows the links to be excluded during the topology calculation for a particular flex algo. This has been requested by some of the, uh, the users of this. We didn't come up, uh, you know, because we thought this is good, but this has been requested on a by the by the real users, and there has been a couple of them. Basically, the use case is you may have disjoint paths through the network where in one of them you want to exclude certain SRLG and on the other paths you want to exclude the other SRLG. So any SRLG failure of a particular group is not going to affect both of the paths. And that way you actually achieve the redundancy if you are sending the redundant flows. The same thing can be achieved, and it has, needs to be clear, it can be achieved by the affinities, but given that users are already used the SRLGs, the idea is that instead of them asking them to yet start to use affinity on top of it, we'll, we can take the SRLGs and use them in our calculation. So it's really just for ease of use and making it easier for users to, to, to deploy this. So what we added from the protocol encoding, we added ISIs and OSPF FAT, exclude SRLG sub TLV, and then during the calculation, we make a rule where we say, check if any exclude SRLG rule, rule is part of the FAT for the algo, and if the rule exists, then we check that the link is part of the same SRLG or any of the ones, then we basically exclude the link from the calculation. So it's very similar to what we do with the affinities. Uh, so that's the first change. Uh, the second change is that we discovered a small issue in terms of uh, leaking the fat uh, in ISIS. The original text in the draft said that we can leak the, the fat as a part of the router capability leaking, where this can be do done when the originator sets the S bit. The problem is that the FAT election uses ISIS system ID and when we when the router capability TLV is leaked, uh, while well, the system ID of the originator is not available anymore. So what we what we come up with a solution, basically we said the ISIS FAT still only has an area scope. That means that it can only be flooded in the router capability TLV where the S bit must be clear. And the ABR or L1, L2 router may be configured to regenerate the winning fat from uh, level two to level one. The regeneration of the fat is controlled by the ABR, not by the S bit. The S bit must be clear when the originators advertise it. And the regenerated fat sub TLV is going to be advertised in the L1 router capability TLV of the ABR router itself. Uh, we don't see really a need to do this uh, other way around from L1 to L2 because really the use case here is I want to have a single FAT definition in my network. I put in my backbone and it goes. Uh, yeah, I can configure my ABRs to leak the, the FAT to all the other L1 areas. There is no need really to do it the other way around. So we put the text in the draft saying the L1 L2 router must not regenerate the FAT from L1 to L2. So basically, what it does is uh, 
takes the winning fad from L2 and advertises it as its own fad into L1. This is basically in a nutshell what it is. That's, those are the two small additions we added to the to the draft. Uh, the next step, so this draft is now almost three years old. The working group adoption happened, uh, you know, two years back. We have multiple implementations available. We have some multi-vendor interoperability testing done. Draft has been stable for some time. These are small details, nothing that, you know, changes any fundamental operation of the Flex Algo. We are considering to close this draft and ask for a working group last call. We are fully aware of the fact that some other Flex Algo, you know, uh, constraints may come uh, in the future, but I mean, this can be specified in a small a new document. We don't need to keep the, the architecture document uh, with all the framework open forever. So. And my personal feeling is we should move with the document and if anything needs to be added, we can add it as a, as a separate document. That's all from my side. Hi, Peter. Do you have any questions? Hi. Yeah. So uh, we got two, I guess I'm in first. I, I, I went through the, the update really fast um, and I don't claim that I know a lot about, I haven't looked closely at the fad, but the thing that jumped out at me is um, if the election is being done domain wide, um, how, but you're not, you're, not, but you're using the system ID of the summary, uh, the summarizing router, right? It's changing. Okay. So let me make a clarification. The FAD election happens inside an area. It's perfectly valid to have different FAD definition or in, in each area. So you can have different FAD for 128 algo in, in one area and a completely different one in the other. It all works. It doesn't need to be the same. So there's no attempt to here to make the the election being domain wide. What the attempt is to, to make it possible to configure the thing on a single or few routers and not necessarily on all uh, or inside all of the areas. So the election is contained within an area. It's not domain wide. Independently, I would say each area independently elects the fat. I mean, obviously, if you if you leak the same fat, they're going to elect the same one. Okay, G, you're up next. What is that? Whoever's typing, please mute. Sounds like Tony. Is it, is it muted though? You don't forget to unmute when you talk. Please unmute if you're three. <laughs> Easy. Oh, up. Uh, you're, 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 giving, you're on the next thing queue? Okay, yeah, I just. Oh, no, no, you you need to unmute. You call in user three. That's G. He can't unmute himself. Okay. Or <laughs> I'm sorry, I do not see. G, can you type your question into the thing? We're going to move on to the next queue. Type oh, your question. Let me in. try the WebEx. Is line still okay? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, good. Because sometimes it does not work. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Peter. I have uh, two questions about your update. Uh, the first is uh, you mentioned that the FAD regeneration can happen uh, from level two to level one, right? Yes. Um, but uh, why you think uh, from level one to level two is not allowed? Well, I, I, from the user perspective, imagine you have your backbone, you have your area, uh, sorry, your network, which has multiple areas. Where would you put your FAD definition? Very likely in the backbone. The reason why we are trying to, to prevent this is to avoid the looping of a FAT, because if we allowed it to be leaked from both L1 to L2 and L2 to L1, you would have to make sure that we never leak something which has been already originated in L2 back to L2 and, and the other way around, which complicates the things. We would have to add more stuff to the TLV 
I, I personally think from the user perspective, having the leaking from L2 to L1 is absolutely sufficient. Okay, so that means uh, the provisioning has to happen on the backbone. Yes. Is, uh, the, okay. And you can so, you can you can obviously define the fad inside ev every area on top of it, if you want to have an election being done there based on the local one which you define. I mean, nobody prohibits you to to do that. But if you don't want to, if you only want to define it on a single place, I think it's fair fair the you know, it's fair to as, uh, assume it's going to be done in the backbone. But again, okay. that doesn't mean you cannot have your FAD in L1. You can, but it will not be leaked to L2. Okay. In that case, uh, as you just mentioned, we can have the same flask algo ID used in, in different uh, level or areas, but has different uh, definition. Yes, that's correct? valid. That is valid, and we actually have a use case even for that. So it's 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 a valid case. And we do support it, and there's everything in place in the draft which allows that. Okay. And uh, another question is: Do you also consider the fat leaking between multiple routing instances or between different protocols? Is that no. What no. But it may, in some scenarios, this, this may be interaction between the protocols or instances. Okay, so the redistribution typically happened to prefixes. We don't redistribute any other stuff. I haven't heard of anything else being redistributed, strictly speaking, if you use that word. So for me, it makes only sense to redistribute something which is attributed to the prefix, but the fact, I mean, obviously your implementation can do this thing, but it doesn't need to be specified in the in the IT draft. It's a local behavior on the router where you do this. If you do it, nobody prohibits you to do that. At the end of the day, it's not going to cause any interoperability issue. But I would not tend to specify this in the draft. Okay. If you don't redistribute it, it means uh, different protocols can have their own maybe 128 plus algos and the IDs can, reu can be reused for different yes. uh, protocol or different instances. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Uh, hi. Hi, Peter. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, hi. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, actually, my question is not about the update of the draft. It is about the flex cycle mechanism itself. Um, my question is whether it is allowed uh, for user to change the value of the metric in in the flex cycle. For example, I uh, I choose latency as the metric in one flex cycle uh, topology, and can I configure the latency uh, of some link larger than it should be? For example, to avoid the touring in some scenario, it's, is that allowed? I mean, look, uh, you can change the metric of the regular, you can change the regular IGP metric based on many things. We have LDP yes. sync, we have stuff like that. You you are allowed yes. to change the delay metric on the link based on what you want. We are not limiting what you, how you can set the delay metric on the link. It's completely outside. Whatever the value you advertise, we use it. Um, but I think here, uh, I see some just like um, paradox because if I want a low delay uh, path, for example, uh, if I can change the uh, metric value, I can uh, make it any value as I want. Uh, when I choose the path, it is not the lowest latency anymore. So, so look, I mean, the, the delay metric should come from some type of measurement on the on the link, right? But I can tell yeah. you, our, our implementation allows you to set it manually. So, you know, you can set it up, uh, it's up to the user to do and how to set the delay metric. We will give you the results based on the metric we have. But how do you, de you derive the delay? It's a, it's a local matter on the box. Okay, okay I see. Thank you. Okay, I think AC, you're up now. Yeah. Uh, 
can, can everybody hear me? Is my mic good? Yep. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think it's good, especially that there's been some implementations in interoperability checking. I think what we should do is just because uh, it's hard to do a poll over the you know, you know over the WebEx, we should just do a poll, see how many have read it, uh, take some time and take some time discussing uh, the working like have a pre working group last call and everybody take a look took, take a look at it and see if uh, if we're ready and then and then if so then uh, do the working group last call I believe Chris I believe you're the shepherd on this one right probably yeah um, I so I guess you're you're saying uh, we're this is a heads up that we're thinking about doing a working group last call so everyone we're gonna do a read it read it um, that's a good idea yeah, I, I, my only concern about uh, is that the the, the additions. Um, it'd be nice to let them soak a little bit before. We oh, absolutely. Back. I mean, I'm I'm not saying we are need we need to do it, you know, this week or next week. Uh, it's just that I don't want to wait another ITF or so because I don't necessarily see a reason why we should not move forward with this. We are not in rush, but I think it has been there for a while. We have everything in place to to close the document. So. Let's yeah, I, mean, I, I looked over this slide originally um, and, and wondered about how we could have multiple implementations with interoperability tested with the, something you just added to it. <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. but yeah, I, it it does feel like this is you know we've been working on this for a while, so everyone should probably read this. You know, um, the idea that that we're we're probably getting close to doing a working last call on it. Uh, AC, I don't know. Did you wanted to do a poll? I, I don't. I don't know how to do like the hands thing in WebEx. So uh, uh, yeah, let's let's do a poll on the list. Should we do it on the list or? I think it's better. Yeah. Hope it doesn't confuse people. Okay, is that it from you, AC? That is it. Yes. Okay, Alvaro, you're up. Thanks, Chris. Can you hear me? Yep. Great, um, Alvaro Retana speaking as a. Uh, individual. Um, so, uh, Peter, um, I haven't read the draft, just out there. Um, hey, good start. <laughs> but uh, you mentioned a couple of things today about, for example, the FAD, where um, you think is more appropriate for people to provision it, how you can provision it at different places, you know, things along those lines. Uh, you also mentioned, for example, in the SR SRLG, when you were talking about that, how you could do very similar things with uh, the affinity, uh, I think is what you said. Um, it would be great if there were some operational considerations in the draft, um, at least showing what you guys were thinking when you wrote it, so that in the future people don't start asking, well, why can't I leak from level one to level two? Um, and you know, it makes sense what you're doing, I think, uh, but it would be really nice to provide some guidance so that when people are actually doing this, they understand, oh, well, this is why, because maybe I should do it in the backbone um, and then leak it from there to other places. So okay, that's it. Well, I can, I can certainly add that. I'm not a big fan of turning the drafts into a white paper, but if you ask me to do so, I can certainly add some data. Great, thank you. Sure. That's it on the, uh, on the mic queue, AC. Okay, um, Sarah. I, actually, I'll, I'll say one more thing. It looks like the recent the recent uh, additions were just this this uh, discussion of uh, capability in in section five point one. So it isn't that much. Uh, yeah, the SRLG has been there for a few months. Right. Yeah, the SRLG has been there for a few months, but the last the last edition was just a clarification. Yeah, but I think this presentation is based on the two revs. Yes. Yeah, because these are the two changes from the last idea. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. Sarah, let's see if she's not. She's unmuted. Okay. Good. Good. Do you want me to pass you the ball, or do you want? Uh, uh, do you do you do you want me to put up your slides? Uh, either way, I think I'll pass them to you if, if that would work. That would probably work better. Yeah, 
perhaps that works. You got it? Oh, uh, yes. Okay, great. I was thinking back to the old days when we used to print things. This would have been a terrible thing for using ink. It's the black background. <laughs> yes. You probably don't remember those days anyway. Okay, so can you see my slides? Okay. Is that too big? Let me sorry. Let me share the PDF files. Easy. Can you can you do the rest of them? Because otherwise, we're going to have to wait for everybody to. Okay. Okay. I can do it. Okay. So, um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, so I will present uh, an algorithm for computed dynamic flooding. Apologies. So a brief for. An um, introduction of dynamic flooding, and um, it decouples the flooding topology from the physical topology. So the data is still forwarded on the physical topology. The link state proctor data is flooded on the flooding topology. So if we choose a sparse subgraph of the physical topology as the flooding topology, then we can reduce the link state flooding. In the dynamic flooding draft, uh, it listed a few requirements on the flooding topology. First, and the flooding topology has to include all the systems in the area. Obviously, everyone wants to receive the link state updates. And second, the flooding topology has to be bi-connected to avoid a single point of failure. So uh, a, a cycle is a good example of bi-connected uh, graphs. If any node or link fails, then we have another path to reach all the other nodes. The remaining flooding topology is still um, connected. The flooding topology um, is also desired to have a bounded diameter. So the diameter of a graph is defined as the distance, the maximum distance between any pair of the nodes. So use uh, cycle as an example. If we have a cycle of n nodes, then its diameter is n over two. This means that a link state update has to travel n over two nodes to reach the farthest node. So in a large network, such a long propagation delay may not be acceptable. And then um, flooding topology is also desired to have a balanced node degree. So the node degree um, is the, num the, uh, the number of neighbors it has to flood to. So it is an indicator of the flooding burden on a node. So we, in the flooding topology, we don't want to uh, overload any node in the area. So use the cycle as the example, it has a perfect balance in node degree. Every node has a degree of two. So this draft um, proposes an algorithm for computing the flooding topology from the physical topology. Um, we do not intend to find the optimal solution, so and we don't intend to standardize this algorithm. This is just a pragmatic approach, um, and we welcome any future research or refinement to improve it. So we model the physical topology as a graph, G. Um, B is a set of nodes and the E is a set of edges. So each edge connects two nodes that advertise each other as neighbors. So we don't have any other conditions on this graph so other than it's connected. Then our goal is to find a subgraph that covers all the nodes. And this uh, subgraph is composed of overlapping small cycles. And we also take into account the diameter and the node degree in the algorithm. 
So the resulting um, subgraph from this algorithm has some nice properties required by the flooding topology. It can be used by the error leader to compute the flooding topology. So here's an outline of this algorithm. Um, we first um, find a, a set of nodes and edges to form an initial cycle. So this is the right cycle on the right, the white cycle on the right. Um, we add this initial cycle to the subgraph we are computing. And then we expand this subgraph uh, in iterations. So in each iteration, we add an arc to the existing um, subgraph. And this new arc pass um, has new nodes and new edges, and its endpoints are on the existing subgraph. So in the example here, in the first iteration, we find uh, the yellow arc, which consists of the yellow, yellow nodes and the yellow edges, and the two ends uh, land on the initial cycle. And in the second iteration, we find the blue arc. And the two ends of the blue arc land on the existing subgraph, which is the white cycle and the yellow arc. So we keep doing that and expanding the subgraph by adding arcs and until all the nodes included in the subgraph. Then we get the, um, the flooding topology. And here are some details of the algorithm. Um, how to find the initial cycle. So we start by selecting a node in the base, base graph, the, the physical topology. And this node can be the node Excuse me. This node can be the node that has the highest degree. And then we do a depth first search for a limited number of steps. So for, in this example, from starting node N0, we find its neighbor N1, and then N2, then N3. And then we stop at some steps. This is just to control the diameter of the subgraph, the initial cycle. After we stop, we switch the gear. We use a breath first search to find a shortest path from the N node in the DFS. Here is the N3 back to the starting node N0. So in the example, we find that N4 is the intermediate step to reach N0. Then we find the initial cycle and zero, one, two, three, four here. Once we have the initial cycle, we can add uh, arcs to the subgraphs. So the procedure is uh, pretty similar. So at the beginning, we have the, the current subgraph. In this case, it's just the initial cycle. Then we find a node on this uh, subgraph. We do a DFS for a limited number of steps, and then we do a BFS to find the shortest path back to the current subgraph. So in this example, in this first iteration, we first find the starting node N0 on the initial cycle, and then we do BFS. Let's say we only did two steps, N1 and N2. And then we find the shortest path back to the any nodes on the initial cycle except the starting node. So here we find the, an N3 and an N and N4. So in each iteration, we add these arcs. The two endpoints of this uh, um, arc pass can be selected um, taking into account the node degree and the, the diameter. So um, we, can, we can select the starting node um, 
by by comparing the node degree on all on the sub current subgraph and also consider the node distance to the initial cycle. So we want to build the arc paths around the initial cycle, do not go very far away. So because that might increase the diameter. So Sarah? Yes. Uh, do you this is AC uh, from Cisco. Do you always use the subgraph you just added for the endpoints of the next one? Uh, yes. Okay. So in the next uh, um, iteration, the subgraph will be the um, this initial cycle plus the yellow arc. So I will choose any point, um, the yellow or white, as the initial and uh, as the starting node. Okay. Thanks. Um, okay. So when um, selecting the end points, sometimes we need to make a trade-off because all the nodes probably on the initial cycle are already used for a few number of um, arcs. Uh, this increases the node degree. So we want to use the nodes in other arcs. So we keep doing that until we find the, all the nodes, we include all the nodes in the subgraph. If the original, um, the, the base graph is biconnected, then using this algorithm, we can find a biconnected subgraph. But sometimes the base graph is not biconnected. It is connected, but not biconnected. Um, and in the BFS stage, uh, we are not able to find any path back to the um, current subgraph. So in this example, let's say we have find a subgraph G prime, and then in this iteration, we pick the node N zero as the st starting um, node. Then we do a DFS, we find N one, N two, N three, and then we stop. But in the BFS stage, we want to find the shortest path from N3 back to the um, current subgraph. There's no way to go back. So, so we can modify the algorithm to just discuss the last DFS node. So we search the shortest path from the second to the last is N2 back to the subgraph. Unfortunately, in this case, we couldn't find any path either. So we discarded the N2, then we only left, there are only one node left, N1. So then we know that N0 and N1, this edge must be in the subgraph. Otherwise, the graph will be disconnected. So we add this to this edge, this cutting edge to the subgraph. And then we start the algorithm again. So similarly, uh, when we find trying to find the initial cycle, we might also run into this scenario. So if we cannot find any cycle on the starting node, then we just pick another node. So the um, subgraph funded by this uh, algorithm has some properties. First, it includes all the nodes. And second, uh, it is bi-connected. Because um, you can you can prove this probably um, by mass mathematic induction. Um, so the initial cycle is a biconnected graph, and then we add arcs that, uh, with two different endpoints landing on the current subgraph. So this basically we have overlapped uh, um, cycles. So this makes uh, and the subgraph also biconnected. And in this algorithm, we also consider the diameter. So it makes some efforts to limit the diameter of the subgraph. And for example, it um, limited the number of steps used in DFS search. So we don't have a very long arc or a very long, a very big initial cycle. So we just stop as after some steps. And then we use BFS to find the shortest path back. So this will limit the size of the initial cycle 
and also the arc in each step. Mm. When we selecting the um, starting node of the arc path, we can select those close to the initial cycle. So the arcs are built uh, around the initial cycle instead of going further, further away. So this, um, the subgraph also has a balance, can have a balanced node degree. Um, when we selecting the starting node of each arc, we can select a node with lower degree. So there might be a trade-off uh, between the diameter and the, the node degree um, in this algorithm. So let's go through quickly go through the example of a complete graph with 10 nodes. So I didn't uh, um, draw all the connections between this uh, among these 10 nodes, but, but all of them are connected. So we use the maximum steps in DFS as three. So we go three steps and then find the way back. So first we we can select any node in this graph as the starting node. Let's say we select N0. Then we go three steps, we find N1, N2, and N3. We stop and then find the shortest path, which because all nodes are connected to each other, so we just go back to N0. So the white cycle is the initial cycle we find. Then we pick a node on the initial cycle. Let's say we pick N1, and then we do three steps in DFS, and four, five, six, and then we find our way back. So this, the end, the end point can be either N0, N2, and, or N3. This cannot be N1, because if we end on N1, which is the same as the starting node, then we have a cutting node. So it's not bi-connected. Okay, let's say we end on N0. So this yellow arc will be the first arc we added to the subgraph. Now we find we started the second iteration. We find a starting point, say N3, and then we go three steps, nine, eight, seven, and then we can come back to any node uh, on the white or yellow except N3. So when we we can choose the starting points and any points of the of the arcs to control the diameter and the balance the node degree. So now we include all the nodes in the graph. We stop the algorithm, and this is the um, subgraph we find for the flooding topology. So we. Uh, this subgraph only has 12 um, edges compared to 45 in the base graph. Um, but the, the, at the cost that we have a larger diameter. So the diameter of this subgraph is 4 versus uh, 1 in the base graph. And the node degree is uh, pretty balanced. We either have uh, node degree 2 or 3. Some nodes have degree of 2, some nodes have 3. And in the base graph, we have uh, no degree of nine. We can also use this algorithm uh, um, for base graph with lens. So we model the pseudo node as a node in the base graph, and it has edges to all the nodes that are connecting to the same lens. Then we use the same algorithm to compute the flooding topology. Um, we can use it as is and get the result. Or we can do a little optimization to consider the land properties. First, um, the student node do not need to be included on the resulting subgraph. So the flooding topology only needs to include all the real nodes. And um, if a student node is indeed included, then it's actually all the nodes connecting to the student nodes and has a unique connectivity. So we can adjust the algorithm to take into account this, uh, uh, these properties of lens. So I'm not going to go into details here. 
In summary, uh, we propose the algorithm that uh, applies to any connected space graph. The subgraph we obtained has some desired properties of a flooding topology and can be used by the error leader to compute the flooding topology in dynamic flooding. Uh, that's it for my presentation. Okay, uh, thank you, Sarah. Is there anybody that has any questions? I don't, I don't see any. Oh, Zhu Song, you're up. Uh, hi, Sarah. Um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, actually, um, I'm wondering whether this uh, algorithm is only for single link failure or it can work uh, when many link failures happen together. Uh, we so our goal is to have a bi-connected graph it's only uh, avoid single link failure if uh, we use this uh, subgraph as the flooding topology and the multiple mm -hmm. uh, failures do happen then we need mm -hmm. need um, we call it partition repair so we need to start a uh, um, flood on the temporary on some links to um, the apology. Uh, so when, the, yeah. when multiple link fails, um, the remaining um, flooding topology is no longer connected. So we need just add edges to that for temporary flooding to fix the flooding topology. Um, if I get this right. right. Sorry. If I get this right, uh, you mean when multiple failures happen together, we don't go back to the the original topology directly. We just do some uh, contemporary uh, flooding in some special links, right? Uh, yeah, this is for every node to react quickly. So we just enable um, edges to for temporary flooding. But the error leader, oh. once the error leader knows the topology change, it will can use the algorithm to make the flooding. Okay. Do you think it it is necessary to end such uh, descriptions about how to uh, handle this case in your draft? Because I think it is very important for the user to know how to uh, deal with this kind of situation. Uh, yes, I think I mentioned somewhere, but I yeah. Let me double check. I will add that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, most of the things that you're talking about with multiple link failures are already covered, but they're in the base dynamic flooding draft, not in this algorithm. Ah, uh, okay. So I will check in another draft to try to find the answer. Thank you. Hello? Yeah, okay. Uh, you know, uh, here I uh, just want to ask one question. Uh, you uh, you mentioned that this uh, algorithm can be used in the centralized mode. Uh, I just want to can can it be used in the distributed uh, distributed mode or and if it uh, used in the distributed mode, can uh, how to infer all node get the same same result? Uh, so. Yeah, that's a good question. You we focus on the centralized uh, mode, and if you want to use the algorithm for the distributed mode, then you need to make sure that the orders, the nodes, um, the order of the nodes and the address are all the same on all the nodes, so the resulting subgraph will be the same. But uh, we don't, we didn't address that. <coughs> Uh, okay. Okay. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Uh, it looks like we're up with Tony. Tony now. Uh, AC, you want? You got that? Hierarchical. Yeah, I, 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 I can, I can uh, present for him. Yes. Know that it'll be that much faster, but if you share the PDF, it doesn't have the scaling issues. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Okay. So. Give 
Can people see it? Yeah, but oddly, it's like a window still. How's this? Oh, there, that's better. Great. That's good, except not for slide. Sorry, I cannot see it. Who's that? I can't. I mean, I got my screen in full screen mode. No, I can see it. Can anyone else not see it? We have one person who can't see it. Looks good from here. Okay, we're going to have to assume it's a networking error. Move forward. Um, hopefully, then the slides are numbered. Called out the numbers. No, they're not. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. I knew they weren't. Uh, why don't we just get going? I think. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good day. This is Tony. Um, I'm going to talk about an update on area proxy. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, since last IETF, we've been doing a lot of work uh, fleshing out the area proxy idea. Um, biggest thing, change that we made, uh, we added support for SR um, in, into the area proxy idea. Um, we are proposing a new kind of SID, uh, an area segment SID. And this is basically a SID that represents everything in the entire area. Uh, this way, if you want to compute a route that touches something in the area and you don't care what it is, uh, you can ad advertise this SID. Uh, this is uh, distributed by the area leader. It gets stuffed into the proxy LSP, and then it has to be accepted by any of the inside edge routers. And thus, this is a form of an Anycast SID. Next slide. see next slide please yeah okay and the format of this looks just like any other sid not very fancy next slide please uh, we also changed a couple of other things um, so we took the error proxy tlv we changed the encoding so that it has now sub tlvs and it now contains the area proxy system ID that was already there. And then we added another sub TLV so that all of the nodes can pick up this area segment SID. Next slide, please. And those look relatively straightforward. The, the first thing you see here is the, the top TLV and then the proxy system ID TL, sub TLV, really straightforward, just carrying around the system ID. Next slide. And then again, carrying around a SID as a sub TLV. Next slide. We also found a issue where we were having trouble distinguishing what nodes and more in particularly pseudo nodes are actually members of the inside area. And so what we were proposing is another top level TLV. Uh, this is to indicate that a node is an inside node. And this would get inserted directly into pseudo nodes as well. Uh, we have no contents for this right now. It's effectively a, a one bit flag. Uh, so the format of this TLV is very straightforward. Okay, next slide. Uh, we also spent uh, some time fleshing out the text, uh, describing all of the TLVs and how they get inserted into the proxy LSP. Um, you can go through all the text to see all of the gory details. Uh, basically, the, the gist of it is, if it pertains to external connectivity, it gets get shoved into the proxy LSP so that the rest of level two can see what's going on. Um, our implementation is in progress. Hang on. Uh, we have the basics working. Uh, we don't foresee any further uh, bumps in the road. Uh, but of course, never know until you've actually had it deployed for a while. And we are still seeking working group adoption. 
Are there any questions about area proxy? Yeah, uh, this is Chris Hops. Um, I, uh, as a working group member, <laughs> the uh, SID, can't the V6, SRV6 SIDs, those are like uh, 128 bits, I think. I, so would the TLV need to be support that? Um, well, I took the format from the existing ISIS SR encodings. Um, if there's 128 bits SID, uh, I don't know how that works. It's a different TLV. This is AC Linda. Ah. Different sub TLV, I mean, yeah. Okay, so I probably haven't done that properly, uh, and I probably need to address SRV6 as well. That was, I was the only one in the mic line, so. Any other questions? This is AC Linda speaking as chair. We did a little discussion, uh, you know, of the uh, requirements for this. And, we, you know, we, we've, all, we've had this problem with this and TTZ having similar, but some, you know, similar mechanisms uh, for abstracting an area, but I mean, there, there's different, different, the drafts cover different details of it. Uh, we didn't get a lot of support for that on the list. I mean, you know, you know, people really wanting it and the, coupled with the fact that we have, uh, we have, we have a lot of, uh, you know, we have this IPR problem, not IPR problem, this, this collaboration problem with uh, the drafts. I know you've said that you have, have a large customer that wants to remain anonymous. Is that still the case? They want to remain, uh, remain anonymous. Several customers, all of whom want to remain anonymous and want to express that they are interested in some result here, uh, but they do not want to pick and choose between the competing implementations. Um, I understand their recalcitrance to participate. Uh, I think it's unfortunate, but it is their decision. Okay. Yeah, I was gonna wait to bring this up until after the TTZ one. Uh, yeah, okay. I'll, yeah, that's I'll hold my we'll... comments until after that. Okay, hey, I'll, I'll, I'll move to the next one. Well, well, I'm, before, before we start hierarchical, which is much less controversial, uh, I wanted to tell everybody to look in the chat there's a link to the ether pad and please sign in with your name and affiliation. If you don't know how to do that or have difficulties, can you send uh, an email to LSR chairs or to me that you weren't able to sign, just send your name and affiliation if you can't uh, sign the ethernet. Ether pad, thanks. Moving on to hierarchical ISIS. Um, as a reminder, uh, please understand that this uh, draft, the, the goal of this draft is to take our current two level hierarchy and expand it all the way up to eight levels. Next slide, please. So the changes that we've made uh, is very straightforward and very simple. Um, so our area identifier TLV uh, we found to be insufficient. Um, and we'll talk about why in just a second. Uh, we're replacing it with a area hierarchy TLV. And this allows us when we advertise to advertise everything about where we are in the global hierarchy. Uh, and this is actually an aid to protecting against misconfiguration. Uh, but basically, in this TLV, um, we have a bit mask of the supported levels. And then following it, we have an identifier for each of the levels. Next slide. Uh, each of these, you, for the level, you have a number of level specific area IDs. And you can encode as many as you like. 
Uh, we spent some time clarifying the adjacency formation uh, rules. They're pretty straightforward. Um, the problem that we're trying to solve here is about preventing uh, cross branching. Um, if we have a misconfiguration and we are not disclosing full information, then we get into this annoying problem where we could form adjacencies between routers A, B, and C, as shown here. Uh, router A belongs to uh, level 4, area 40. Router C belongs to level 4, area 44. Router B, because he's only at level 3, is in 30, and he now forms adjacencies to both of his neighbors. Uh, since they match on level 3, that seems like it's sufficient. However, this is actually a mistake. Uh, misconfiguration, because now we have two level 4 areas interacting directly. We don't want those adjacencies to form. So this is what we felt is not sufficient. Um, what we're proposing instead is that everyone disclose full information. It's pretty much a brute force solution, but it does seem to help things. Um, as you see in the bottom picture, now we end up in a situation where router B is advertising its full hierarchy, 30, 40, 50, and when it goes to form an adjacency with router C, it can see that it has inconsistency at level 4. Don't form the level 3 adjacency because level 4 doesn't match, and therefore we get around that problem. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's basically all the rules. Um, so if you have uh, information about where you are in the hierarchy, you must support, must advertise it. Uh, if you do not know what levels you want, uh, have supported, you can advertise a dummy LSI, LSAI, and uh, we're just using zero. So you can say, I don't know where, I don't know what level eight number is going to be there someday, but we're going to reserve it anyway. And you can add a level by using multiple LSAI at a particular level and then removing things as you don't need them. Uh, we think this interoperates reasonably well with legacy routers. Of course, they can get confused if they're in the case of router B in the previous picture, uh, but they don't have enough information. Um, uh, if you have mismatch, then legacy routers will cause some issues, uh, but you can detect it by looking at TL, uh, looking at TLVs in the LSPs, because they will have full hierarchy information too. Uh, that's everything. Any questions? Well, it looks like I'm in the queue again. Um, I, I, uh, so I think a picture it might really help, like just a really simple little tree would help explain the problem. Since we're we're actually not used to dealing with this multiple higher you know multiple levels, it's not immediately obvious. Sort of, I think pretty much make it. Um, the, but anyway, that's just a comment. The the it, would it work to just advertise? I mean, just to reserve this zero or whatever and advertise it always. Just make that a mandate. Um, then you don't have to worry about the op. Because I got the feel when I read the draft that it was a suggestion. You know, that like operators configure it that way. Um, you can, you could do that. We felt that you have to be able to expand uh, levels anyway. Uh, so once we have the mechanism for expansion in place, we don't actually have to pre-reserve things. I, I mean, for the, for, you know, you're saying you should, if, if you ever might plan to use a level five, you should start by advertising zero. So someday when you get there, you don't have a transition problem, right? Right. So all I'm saying is, if you just advertise zero in all levels that aren't configured, then you never have that problem. You know, then it's it's done already, right? It's not operational. You could do that, of course. You're spending LSP space if you do. Um, okay, Les, you're up. Yeah. So Chris, I just to uh, additional response on that. Um, if you 
if you know if you know what area addresses you want to use at each level, even though you're not currently deploying, say level five, six, seven, eight, you can certainly advertise them. You don't need a dummy. But if you haven't decided yet, like I have no need for level five, six, seven, eight right now, I'll just advertise zero. And whenever I get around to needing level five, I'll figure out what number I want in there. That's the idea. That makes sense? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I understood the transition. It's just, I just thought it was thinking maybe if we could take it out of the operational, you know, you wouldn't have to guess if it was just always set. But as Tony points out, that's, there's a trade off, you know, with the LSP space of that pre reservation. By the way, that my comment was question was as a working group. Yeah, I'm just saying you you don't have to use a dummy. Oh yeah. Okay. You're, right. You're saying you you don't have to. You, you're saying that you could put the number real values in there and not enable those levels. Still, I think you're saying. Correct. That's correct. It doesn't look like there's anybody else. So, I, just, I had one question. This is AC speaking to working room chair. Has anybody experimented with implementing this? Uh, I had the same thought, AC. Uh, I guess speaking as a chair as well, I would, it, was, it would be interesting to see if anybody. Um, Get some people in research involved or something. Doing some simulation. I I don't know. Uh, I think we heard at a previous meeting that uh, the the customers that were interested in this might have changed their mind and moved to some other solution. Maybe I'm misremembering. Well, I think yeah, I think now now that sounds familiar as well. So the customers who are interested in this are still interested. However, um, the fact of the matter is the multi-instance is uh, very capable of doing similar things. And so it seems like that might be an adequate workaround. Uh, so nobody's in a rush to implement this at this point. Yes, we most up. I noticed. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I'm gonna I'm gonna put your slides up. I I noticed uh, like about seven or eight, eight to ten people signed in, but there's still a lot of people that haven't signed the Ethernet Etherpad with their uh, name and affiliations. We're using that as in lieu of blue sheets for this meeting. Okay, we you tell me when you're right, ready. Thank you. Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. Hi, hey, everyone. Today I'm going to just uh, brief the TDZ. Okay. Yeah, uh, next page. So, in the center of uh, this picture is a uh, zone. Zone here is a uh, zone, is a block of area. Or, in special case, a zone can be an entire area. So we see zone in the center of this picture. So if we go up, then we abstract the zone as into a single pursuit node. So if we, after we abstract a zone to be a single pursuit node, if for some time or for some case, we wanted to we organize zones. For example, we want a zone to include a bigger piece of area, or we want to merge two zones into one, or split a big zone into two. So in this case, we can transfer zone, uh, we can transfer the pursuit node back to zone. Then we can 
split zone or whatever transfer zone or abstract different zones to pursue node again. So for this kind of abstraction from zone to pursuit node, and uh, we transfer pursuit node back to zone. For this, we have uh, solutions in the draft. So we have uh, solutions for from OSPM point of view and from ISS point of view. So this is uh, one one uh, big part in the existing draft right now. In addition to that, we also have a solution for abstract a zoom as the edges of the zoom so for the marsh. So we if we go from the center of the picture zoom going down, abstract the zoom as those edges for the mass. So we can also move back from edges for the mass to the zoom. So and then we can rearrange the zoom and then uh, abstract back to different zones and SF edges for the mass. So regarding to this part, we have solutions in the draft for SIS. So for a short zoom to uh, to be a edges for the mass, the solution for OSPF we already uh, that part is already become a RFC RFC eight zero nine nine. So this is the overview of the topology. TDZ in this uh, in in this draft. So thanks, Paige. So regarding to the update for the current draft, so we uh, just change or add some requirements. So originally in the draft we have some kind of requirements such as uh, we must be uh, backward, compa backward compatible, and then we must support at least one more level hierarchies for network scalability. In addition to that, we also add some uh, requirements such as transfer a zoom to be a pursued node or edges for the mesh should be smooth with minimum surface interruption. So another requirement is that if we roll back from pursuit node to zoom or from edges mass to zoom. So this kind of rollback should be also smooth with a minimum or no traffic interruptions. So we add that these are uh, two uh, more requirements. And then we also have uh, uh, some more existing requirement in the original draft. So I think that we should have a uh, some feedback from our service provider from you. So we so if they can provide more requirements or provide some opinions about this requirement, and I think that would be great because uh, from the mailing list, I think that a couple of our service providers they show their interests for move forward for different kind of abstractions. So next page. Yeah, I think that's all. I think we, uh, we would like to have uh, uh, comments from people, either several provider or other uh, fingers. Hi, okay, this is uh, Chris Hops. Um, I was told I was too quiet, so I turned the gain up in case I'm blowing the speakers out now, let me know. Uh, Right, so there's a, a, so right. We have two different solutions trying to solve this, basically the same problem. I'm I'm not sure what to do with that. Um, the uh, uh, you know of this, I didn't actually go back and look at the the couple of responses that we did get about people publicly saying they wanted this. How many of them used OSPF as their network? Right, like. <laughs> 
I mean, the solution is actually there as an experimental RFC, right? Has it been? Has the OSPF version been implemented by vendors, and it, is it live in networks? Email. Yeah, that's a good question. No, uh, we have implementations. Uh, we have uh, prototype implementations, and then we can. Uh, well, I don't know. We uh, I don't think we have uh, deployed them yet. So that I mean that's one way to gauge the interest, you know, is um, the the OSPF one, as far as I know, hasn't been deployed, even though there there's an RFC. I mean, we're just trying to dodge the bullet here that that we have this, uh, you know, the solutions are very similar. There are differences. This was called out back in like ITF one hundred four, I think. You know, there's the zone boundaries are different. Um, there's some. Differences in, the, in what's inside the the LSP that's get advertised, you know, and a couple other. But it, it really does feel like this is more. We have two things because of political reasons and not technical. Um, not, I'm not sure what to do with that. AC. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm not sure either. Uh, I think we have one more that isn't exactly the same, solves the same problem. That's a uh, reflector coming coming up. Uh, yeah, I I don't know what we do, especially given public support. I mean, in the past when we haven't had did from an A, we, we did experimental for all of them. And work, I don't think the work went too far after that. I mean, people did implementations. Yeah, well, uh, Tony is in the mic. So, Tony, P, Aganda? Uh, speaking as working group, oh, he's ready. He's ready to present. Okay. No, no, he's in the, he's got, he's on the queue to his question. Go ahead, Tony. You muted? You might be, I don't know. Okay, well, let me see, let me see this. Now that I'm sharing, I'm having trouble getting my full thing back. Uh, well, he's going to have to figure out the mic problem because he's presenting next. I know, I know. I know. <laughs> no, we can't hear you, Tony. He's chatting. He's in the chat room. In the, uh, okay. Uh, okay, so Tony's going to rejoin. Should um... no, no, I, I think, I, yeah, I don't see him in. I don't even see him join now. Yeah, he's rejoining. Okay, um, we'll give this one more shot, and then we'll, I guess, move on. Okay, AC, so... was was your? Are you sort of brainstorming that we should? maybe try experimental and see how let market forces decide or well that's what the, the you, you know we will mention that the ospf was an rfc it's an experimental rfc because we really didn't right we especially you know, there were a lot of complexities with the with the zone uh transformations combining zones and everything uh, we thought there was a lot of corner cases there, and that was that was one thing. So, still don't see Tony. Participants, uh, yeah, that. So, oh, here he is, Antonio. Okay, and he's unmuted. Can you speak? We can't hear him. No. Okay, we'll we'll push you down in the agenda, Tony. Um, 
you can you can call in. Do you want to move to the next? Sure. Mimo, that would be you. Okay, thank you. Uh, just give AC a second to pull up your presentation. Can I ask a quick question? The working group participant. So, what did we agree to? We didn't. <laughs> I think we need to talk to you, as not as a working group participant, but as a. Uh, no, just so just to be clear, it's a good thing that you brought that up. Um, because you're um, you're on the draft, we have to talk. One to of the drafts, yeah. and uh, as you guys know, but so that everyone already knows too, um, Martin agreed to agreed to need an AD to you know, be the AD. Um, he has been you know briefed on everything, you know the whole stuff. So don't talk to me. Talk to him. Yep. Great, I got gotcha. you. Backing. Quick test, you guys hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, so whenever you guys get to me, I'm sitting here. Okay. We can go back. I think I think this is better to do this one right. Yeah, we'll be uh, continuity. Yeah, thanks. Put it. Certainly not going to watch this recording. I'll think that I need Prevagen. All right, cool. So AC, you're breaking up pretty badly. I try to reconstruct what you're saying. Ready to go? Yes. Okay, perfect. So this is just a quick update. I'll be probably on the time uh, for the uh, flood reflector stuff that has been going on for a while. Uh, next one, please. Um, okay, so um, uh, this is pretty much an update based on two things. One of them is that we have very extensive discussion with Les and Peter. So thanks a lot for all the time, you know, and um, stuff that they pointed out, we discussed through as options and uh, basically uh, implementation experience and uh, deployment consideration, you know, deployment plannings. Um, uh, some readability improvements, so there were some comments from a couple of other people about making it a little bit more readable, as such that. Uh, a couple of sections has been added mostly for clarification and some split for uh, easier readability. Next one, please. All right. So um, uh, we described uh, in some detail, probably not enough operation without L1 tunnels, right? So if you run this thing, uh, the draft basically describes how you run it if you build a full mesh of L1 tunnels between the leaves uh, or basically ingress, egress, uh, border nodes, um, which is the simple mode. That's kind of a no brainer. Uh, but you can also deploy the stuff without any tunneling whatsoever, which you know has upsides and downsides, depending what you look for. Um, we also described the implications uh, of what happens when you start to leak L2 prefixes into L1 in such a reflector scenario. So basically into an area which is fully or partially reflected. Um, and we did further simplification based mostly on what people really ask for um, uh, as deployment um, to uh, simplify the whole thing. Um, so it could be we we did something that it could do okay so basically right now uh we define that the router is uh, strictly either a client or a reflector or nothing at all right in the middle and you can only run one client or one reflector on the router uh, uh and we already disallowed the links between reflectors that is largely based on uh, what was happening in bgp route reflector hierarchies and when people started to mesh uh, reflectors in the same uh, cluster and all the cluster id uh, and then uh, whatever it was called the uh, identifier of the router in the cluster so a client cannot particip participate in multiple clusters uh, that was a discussion i think uh, mostly less the thinking there um, where we have these strange things where, and we already have to today without you know any technology whatsoever when areas can merge when you have multiple area IDs and they overlap. Um, 
So we basically, uh, uh, to prevent all these merging scenarios and merging scenarios of um, possibly clusters, we basically added something that says that you can only be in a single cluster as a client or as, as, a, as a reflector. And that's fairly simple because you advertise 242, which is the capability thing, and we just allow a single um, cluster ID in such a thing. Next one. Next one. Did I drop off? You should be on slide four. Uh, yeah, okay, so now it's flipped. Okay, so. Uh, more detailed changes, and that's already pretty much the last one, is um, so there was long discussion about the cluster ID, um, whether we should couple it to something like area ID or other, you know, copious amount of different identifiers that we have. And we back, went back and forth with all these area merges scenarios and people reconfiguring and in deployment, how you manage the stuff. And um, we decided that no, we decoupled the cluster ideas. It's completely um, independent concept of everything else, kind of like well, no, all the BGPs. And um, uh, to prevent, you know, in terms of like deployment surprises, we basically added that the cluster ID should be unique across the network. So basically, each uh, whatever you run, so let's, let's assume we're running L1, uh, ISIS is this thing where we're reflecting all the stuff around. Um, uh, the cluster ID will be unique in each of these L1 across the network. Uh, so operationally, you know, if, if something uh, goes wrong, these things will not merge and they're easy to identify who and where. Um, so a single L1 area basically has a single cluster inside. Um, but uh, of course, you can build arbitrary um, uh, redundancy by basically having multiple reflectors, right? Um, and we uh, have a section explaining uh, more what will happen when you leak L2 prefixes into L1. And, and again, you know, like deployment discussions um, to prevent uh, more complex considerations, which, which is all working, but it's just like you want to deploy operationally, you know, have these things simple and all the existing tooling works without, you know, a lot, a lot, a lot of backwards uh, bending. So when leaking, we basically define that all leaves should be, so all, you know, egress, ingress into area should be reflect of clients. It will work without, but that's what we say, right? And these conditions, by the way, are fairly easily detected because you flood around L1, so you know who is client and who is reflector and who is the Um And uh, why that is also done, because if you leak uh, L2 into L1 as a leaf and you know the reflector, then when someone computes across the reflector adjacencies, you can be egress anyway. So it's kind of pointless, you're leaking, right? Because if the, if the forwarding happens, uh, so if you know the client, you will have, have not L1 tunnels to the other leaves. And if you try without tunnels, then you cannot be an egress, right? Because then you basically start to do surprising things in terms of forwarding because people of outside of the, of, of the cluster compute everything through L2 adjacencies, to, so they expect you to follow to an egress, right? You have to take a certain egress for the whole thing to be consistent. So the leaf that is not a client, even if it shows the prefixes, will never be chosen as an egress. Uh, we describe in more detail how computation is run. So the computation is now uh, really, really simple. Um, you basically have two hop computation. And then if you decide, and that is still allowed, again, uh, no practical consideration uh, deployment, is that the clients can build straight L2 adjacencies between them and the computation uh, can take that into account. So that's also working as expected. Um, I think the stuff has been brought to the list as I think a very kind of vague um, problem definition. I think there was a support by a couple of people summoning toward this solution. Um, so, of course, you know, we would like to see this work adopted and rolling forward since, we you know, we have enough interest and, like I said, uh, stuff is kind of reality rolling forward at this point in time. Uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much everything I have. Uh, questions? Hi, this is Chris Ops. As a working group member, uh, I, I went back over the draft and wasn't able to put it all in my head. Uh, it's still... Uh -huh. It still seems a little complex to me, but um, I, I, I'm wondering, can you, is it, is this draft trying to do, is this solution trying to, to do two, two things? I mean, it talks about using L1 as a transit for L2. 
Yeah. Uh, but it's also trying to do flooding reduction, right? No. I mean, you don't see any flood reduction algorithms in it. Of course, flood reduction will work over the stuff. Uh, it's, I mean, well, um, so um, uh, if, if I'm forced to compare, right, uh, this is uh, presenting a much smaller L2 topology. So naturally, your flooding will be far less. Right. Without any further additions to the protocol or complex computations or, you know, um, any other surprises. It's just standard flooding. There's just much less L2 topology to flood around. And that's what it is. Because the L1, of course, is contained to the L1. So, in a sense, it gives you our traditional hierarchy. I mean, so we didn't, we didn't think through any of this hierarchical draft, right? So, I looked at the hierarchical. Um, I uh, think I talked, you know, less and with the Paul through the hierarchy, you know, bifurcation problems. I think the solution presented there is fine, right? It has certain properties, but, you know, it's always the static versus dynamic surprises, right? Because if the, if the hierarchy levels get renegotiated, you may end up, you know, tearing down adjacencies again. So I think what they have is something which is more static, but more predictable. So that's fine. As Tony previously pointed out, the multi instance stuff, from what we see for all practical purposes, can solve the problem as well in a kind of more um, dynamic uh, and flexible way. But you know, it's not the dynamic is not necessarily desirable. I think we will need some operational description how that works. We don't need additions to protocols, but there's some consideration what people implement and how you can, the implementation, what they can enforce for the multi instance stuff doing the same thing. Um, but uh, we didn't think how that will work with uh, multiple hierarchy levels because, you know, we, we just don't see right now a question for it. Um, so this is basically just traditionally presenting a much lower L2 topology while suspending the limitation that you cannot have the whole entropy of L1 when you uh, traversing it. Yeah. And um, lots of this, um, where the thinking was going here was uh, driven by operational constraints, right? Like tooling. This stuff will work without any changes, for example, with VGPLS, right? You can take the topology out of L1 and out of L2 and do all stuff you're doing today on the traditional tooling, which you know, is a large consideration to customers. And also this thing can be basically flipped on gradually without a lot of forklifting, which is another, you know, for, for the customers, we have a very important consideration. I hope I answered that in, in a somehow certain, you know, yeah, uh, substantial way. Any other questions? I, I, I'm uh, presenting, so I can't. This is AC. I have uh, some comments as a working group member. The one thing about, you said you added a se section on not using, needing tunnels. I think it was one statement that says through proper use of scoping, not really a section. Uh, well, so the, obviously the prefix leaking and the no tunnel operation are intertwined, right? So the, the leaking prefixes is basically yeah. That's how you run it without tunnels if you do it correctly. Yeah. Okay. You leak the prefixes. Yeah. Just like OSPF virtual link. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay. yes. I mean, the, the price you pay is virtual links. I mean, no, no magic here. Right. right. I mean, we talked about the stuff. I mean, I don't, I don't have pixie dust. Yeah. So there's another, yeah. There's another, there's another comment I'd like to make. This draft has, if you read the introduction of it, can envision how the area proxy or TTZ would be used in the same in a in a data center fabric because it has the best picture of exactly how you use L1 to uh, as transit or, or you know for L2 before I mean if you look at that before you do any optimization so that's a good point and the other question is this is a question. How would you scale this given given the cluster ID? How would you scale this to multiple? Would you have multiple L1 areas? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That are that are that are, that are connected at L2 at yeah, precisely. L2s, yeah. L2s, and they would they would talk to their edge nodes, and then could just you could just you know you know go laterally across you know. Yeah. Just, 
Yes. Yeah. Precisely. So basically, we, we uh, the advantage, well, advantage, whatever. I mean, the desired properties here is that you just carve a piece, make it L1, and at L2, basically nothing shapes much. Yeah. Except you see much more topology while still getting all the, you know, uh, uh, basically forwarding diversity through L1. Yes. So no, it, it, there is no like nefarious like plan to build completely different networks. No, it's it's a very practical problem. People just ran out of L2 scale, and we both know that scaling implementation is, you know, it's a hell of an exercise. So yes, of course, everybody's doing what they can, right? But this is. Uh, but you know, if if you do whatever smart thing you do, and you tell people that they have to forklift the whole uh, the whole network at those sizes, it's a complete no-brainer, no starter. Even forklifting a whole part of the network is a no starter. So the, the 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 TTC draft says, okay, we can carve these things and slowly migrate the stuff and so on. But those are real considerations, right? So this also has these properties. In a sense, even better because inside you don't have to touch anything. So you're really affecting the borders and whatever the reflectors, which don't even have to be routers, which is another interesting problem. Uh, to, to, uh, AC Tony is in the mic queue as well. If you're, yeah, I'm, I wasn't going to say anymore. Okay. Tony, uh, you're up. Uh, thanks, Late AC covered it. Never mind. Tony's out of the mic queue. <laughs> okay, is that it? Yeah, from my side, sure. No more questions. All cool. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yep. Today, I'm going to present IGP for network availability. So, right now, more and more network is controlled by central controller. Uh, okay, next page. Right now, more and more network are controlled by central controller. So the central controller is a single point of failure for the network. So the, the controller reliability or high availability is very important for network reliabilities. So for so here we consider a controller as a uh, cluster, controller cluster. So from outside, from outside this point of view. Cluster is a single controller, but from the inside point of view, the cluster consists of a number of individual controllers. So when micro failure or failure happens inside the cluster, so those individual controllers may be split into separate control groups. And then after this split, so each group will elect as a primary controller group, and then we may have multiple primary controller groups or controllers, which will control the network at the same time, because uh, they are split, they are out of sync, and then they control the network at the same time, and then we may have some issues. So here, uh, we propose some kind of ITP extensions to resolve these uh, this issues. Next page. So the proposal is here. So we introduce an ITP proxy inside each controller inside the uh, cluster. And then we have an uh, uh, adjacency. Each ITP proxy has an adjacency to one node in the network domain. So when we have multiple failures and then the, all the controllers was split the inside, and then in this case, so we only elect one intent primary controller in one group to advertise minimal information about the controller in, in, in each group. Because every in the separate group will attribute this information to the authors. So every separate group will have all the information about the authors. So in this case, so one, exactly one primary group will be elected correctly and control the network correctly. So 
So that's the idea here. So next page. So here we just summarize the minimum information will be advertised by the primary controller in the cluster or intend primary controller in a group. So in normal, in normal case, the cluster works fine and then only primary controller in the cluster will advertise the information, minimal information such as current position. So if it's primary controller, current position is one, and then my priority, and then the number of controller in the cluster, and then the IDs of each of my controllers. When this happens, the cluster is split into multiple individual controller groups. Each group will elect primary controller and second controller, or this is a election is a record intent, not because it's not finally decided yet. So each for each group, only intent primary controller will identify information about its group. And then after those information is distributed to every uh, controller, and then each group will elect the final primary group. So here we also uh, propose the tie breaking because, uh, for example, we have different policies to elect primary controller group. For example, one one policy or strategy is that the biggest group will be become the final primary group. But for some case, two groups ha may have the same number of controllers. So in this case, we have also proposed some type breakings. For example, we may use a uh, priority as type breaking, or in another case, we may use uh, the older position. So if uh, the group have has the highest old, old position, for example, one group has a uh, original primary controller, then that group will be will be win. So use this kind of type ring group and then we will finally elect one exactly one primary controller group control the network. Next page. So this just give uh, extensions uh, to the OSPIR protocol. So the extension is just to add uh, uh, one TLV to all the information I'm saying. So this information just the uh, uh, position, order position, priority, and then the number of controllers and control IDs in, in the group. Next page. So similarly for us, uh, ISS, so we just add a TLV, TLV or sub TLV and then to contain that information. Next page. So this is just give a, a example procedures for recovery. So if we have multiple failures and then we split a, a, a cluster into multiple group. Here we just give example, we split the controller cluster into two groups. One group is, group one is AC and then group B is B and N. And then we have two groups and each group have just two uh, controllers. So each group will elect uh, intent primary and uh, intent secondary and so on. For example, in group one, A will be intended primary group primer, and then in the group two, B will be the intended primary controller. So for each group, only the intended primary controller will advertise the information about each group. So after those information advertise, each group will elect the real primary controllers. So here, because each group will have number two, and then they will using type break rules. Here we just use the older position because uh, uh, A is a older primary controller because he has the highest, highest uh, position. So group one will be elected as a primary group. So group one will be the really elected primary group. So group, group one will become the primary group and then on total network. The next page. That's all about it, and then I would like uh, the comments from the group. Okay, so uh, first up in the queue, I think, is Tony Lee. Uh, first question, um, 
seems to me like this is the controller to controller communication channel that you're using here. Um, why does this need to go into the IGP? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, the con uh, so the controller channel, uh, we have controller channel, and this is uh, uh, the information channel. So this information channel is only uh, used to distribute the minimal information about controllers. So on when the inside failure split the group. So why why do you have to make this so complicated? It seems like even if you wanted insisted on doing this in the IGP, you basically could have each instance advertise itself and say, "Hey, I'm a controller," and then deal with this outside of the IGP. All the election stuff should not be in, involved here. Yeah, the uh, election stuff is inside the uh, is inside the controller. It's not uh, related to IGP. So here, just uh, those uh, election procedure. For a uh, recovering procedure, those are inside the cluster. So IDP just uh, distribute those informations. Okay, I must not understand what information you're trying to provide. Your TLV through a list of controller IDs. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, yeah, the controller IDs will be there. Controller can advertise itself and inject a T uh, LSP. You'd be done. Yeah, yeah, that's right. The, in fact, the from a protocol point of view, so those IDP just identifies information about the controllers, and that's all. And then those kind of procedures inside the controllers, all right? Why do you need a proxy? Why do you need somebody advertising multiple controller IDs? Oh, that's a, a yeah, yeah, yeah. So those controller IDs is, uh, is sometimes needed. Sometimes uh, more, more, normally we don't need that. That uh, those are ID, A's ID, B's ID, and uh, C's IDs. I, I agree. Yeah. Okay, I still don't understand. Never mind. John. Uh, so, um, point number one, Tony said about half of what I wanted to say. I agree with his comments. Point number two. Um, just to add, and I, this is sort of similar to what I mentioned during IDR at the mostly similar talk. Uh, th this is a um, consensus problem. It's it's a well known problem in computer science. Uh, there are some well known solutions. Um, it doesn't seem to me like they need to be baked into routing protocols. Uh, and what I discovered this morning as you were talking is that there's, if you even think that it needs to be standardized, there's apparently already an IETF RFC 7787 called Distributed Node Consensus Protocol, um, which if you're going to invent a consensus protocol, it would probably be smart to begin by looking at what we already have in the RFC set. Uh, I, I'm not actually recommending this thing, because like I said, I just discovered it, but it exists. Uh, end of comment. Yeah, I think this is to provide a, a muscle way to uh, provide a, a reliability. Yeah, I think I know that uh, for those kind of reliability or HA, the number of, way, number of ways there, I think this is a, a muscle way, and then maybe similar. You see, we can see that we just uh, distribute the minimum information using IGP, and then we just add one TLV, and then we resolve the most of the problem, right? Okay, uh, this is Chris Ops as, as a working group member. Um, I sort of echo the earlier comments. I'm going to try, try to prune mine down, uh, but I will. Oh, I guess I'm going to repeat that. It, yeah, consensus is a well-studied problem, and you know, Paxos, Raft, Zab from Zookeeper. And if you go uh, and look at them, you know, there's significant research and and proofs. And this kind of just feels like, hey, check this out, right? I mean, so th that brings me to other, my, my next thing that I was thinking as I read through this is that there's five authors in this draft, but there's no references to any prior art. I mean, this is not you know consensus and leader election and stuff is well studied and it's not a good sign if you just come in and you, and you haven't got any references to what people have done 
before, right? It, it, I mean, we're not in the uh, job as, as this working group, I think, of of coming up with you know consensus algorithms. Um, so we're not necessarily the experts. So it certainly helps if you have the prior art listed showing the justification. But again, as Tony said, uh, why is it even, you know why is it here? Right? Why are we even talking about consensus algorithms when it's, you know, well anyway. Um, so yeah, it, but beyond that, to get more to the IS, ISI, sorry, LSR thing, um, <laughs> the, uh, if this were going to go any, this this sort of falls into a comment I'm going to have later too. But this, it's even if you do something, it would be to advertise, like Tony was saying, to advertise, you know, the cluster IDs. I mean, not the cluster IDs, the, um, the you know, the, the controllers and. Then you're talking about basically using IGP as a as a transport for information that has nothing to do with the IGP, and this is again this is going to be my comment later on uh, the IFIT stuff. But if all the rest passes muster, then at minimum it would I would think it would go in Gen App. This advertisement I mean about you know what applications are running in the network. That's, we don't want we don't want that in the IGP. That's all my comments. Yeah, I think that's a good comment. Uh, then, uh, then we're missing the reference, and then we're missing class ID, whatever the ID is, and then we, uh, yeah, from protocol point of view, and the protocol just as a transport. I, I agree with all of that. Yeah, that's okay. I don't think I missed anyone else in the queue. So, uh, thanks. So, AC, I think we're um, a passive interface attribute. Oh, looks like that's came out. Again. Hello. Hello, can I begin? Yes, Aijin, you can begin. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so here we just want to introduce our thought on the passive interface attribute. So next, uh, next slide. Uh, you know, uh, uh, in 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 our network, we just use the SDN controller to get the under topology of the underlying network uh, why the bgpls and uh, currently the bgpls can only report the links within one domain uh, and uh, it can't distinguish the border link from the internal links uh, there are uh, one draft in the ideal group for the interest topology retrieval and in this draft, uh, it defines the stop link on LR to report the border link via the uh, new LR. Uh, so, uh, router, uh, router, you know, in this diagram, there are two, uh, two domain. One, one domain is run OSP, another domain is run ISS. So, uh, for router within the OSPF domain, uh, for example, S2, uh, can extract the border links. Uh, according to the type that the uh, type indication uh, uh, which is stated in the router LSA uh, but the uh, ISS has no such information so the router uh, for example T1 cannot uh, extract uh, or distinguish the border link from the other internal links uh, and there are other uh, other uh, scenarios that we, we want to uh, distinguish the edge links uh, uh, from the other link, so for the for some security reason, so um, you know we we want to put some different uh, policy in the border link. So here we just want to distinguish distinguish the border link and the uh, edge link from the other normal internal links. So next next <coughs> next slide, please. Mm. 
So uh, the, uh, our proposal for a solution uh, is uh, illustrated in this uh, slide. Uh, RC 7794 have def uh, defined the IPv4 and IPv6 extended reachability attribute flag sub TLV to advertise the additional flag associated with the prefix. Uh, currently, uh, it defines the four, um, four flags. Uh, here we want to uh, propose and one flags named P for passive or S for stub to indicate that the prefix are coming from one passive or stub links. Uh, so um, uh, if the edge router uh, um, tag this tag the prefix uh, in 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 this information, the receiving router, uh, especially the router that runs the BGPLS, can easily extract such links from the internal links. And uh, popul uh, populate the uh, the edge links in the sublink NLR that defined in the uh, IDR uh, working group. So uh, next uh, next slide. <coughs> uh, you know uh, we have um, uh, some discussion on the main list. There are other proposal uh, for the for the question. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Tony and. Uh, and Robert had mentioned the RFC uh, uh, five five zero uh, two nine. He also um, defined the link attribute uh, sub TLV to advertise the additional information about the link character characteristics. Uh, currently, they define three bits, uh, but we uh, but I have uh, we have um, investigated this uh, sub TLV uh, and find that this sub TLV only included. Uh, in the in the TLV that that related to the uh, existing of the IS neighbor, but uh, but the current scenario in, in our in the current scenario there is no IS neighbor, uh, so uh, we think the uh, it is not uh, appropriate to put the information in this uh, TLV, so we prefer to add the uh, extra information in the prefix advertisement. That is to say, the prefix is from uh, one passive or stop links. <coughs> Next slide, please. <coughs> so uh, 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 we have some discussion on the main list. I here just want to: Is there any other comment uh, for this uh, solution? And also, thanks for the expert for the past review. Uh, okay, that's all. <coughs> <coughs> Ketan Talalikar Cisco. Uh, hi, Agent. Uh, so, about using prefixes for identifying links, I think uh, that, as discussed on the list as well, that doesn't seem like an appropriate uh, way uh, for you know signaling or identifying links or inter AS links as as what uh, you know you're looking for here. Um, even in OSPF, for that matter, uh, the stub, the link type stub, doesn't really distinguish between, uh, uh, you know, what type of link it is. And if for point-to-point -point links, for example, that stub type is also used for the link address. So I don't, I don't believe that using this stub or passive interface flag uh, is a good way of, uh, you know. You know Coming up or figuring out the topology. We we uh, we have uh, do we have another idea to 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 find out the edge link there? Yeah, I think we can uh, we can uh, look at other proposals. Uh, we can you know discuss offline and try to see if there is a a different solution uh, for this objective. Mm, okay. Okay. Uh, uh, I just have some investigation and find the such solution can can be easily implemented. And I think we can also find other proposal. Or uh, as you mentioned, okay. Mm. <coughs> okay. Well, it sounds like there's still more discussion on this. On the list to be had. All right. Well, thank you.
Let's see. I think we're going to uh, update uh, Yali with the uh, IGP extensions for iFit. Yes, I'm here. Anyone can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now you're, now you're having feedback. Okay. <laughs> I'm afraid. Okay. First of all, uh, I thank uh, all of the reviewer on the email list, gave the kind uh, comments and the suggestions about this draft. And next, I will introduce this draft. Um, so, um, and in the iFit framework draft, uh, it gives a, a overview and a complete framework. Uh, about the unpass uh, telemetry te uh, techniques, uh, including IOM and uh, PBT and etc. Et oh, next page, please. Okay, so uh, we found that the iFit is a solution focus on the network domains. So it means that uh, within an, an IFA domain, there uh, on past te uh, te uh, telemetry techniques may be uh, selective, uh, selectively or uh, partially uh, be enabled uh, in different devices. So um, this draft, we trying to uh, solve the problem to uh, to uh, before we we dynamically enable iFit uh, application in a given network domain. Uh, so we we need to find and uh, advertise the iFit node capability uh, of the devices in a network domain. So uh, let's draft we extend the IGP and the BGP uh, else uh, protocol to uh, to advertise the iFit capability. Uh, next, please. So uh, yes, uh, you may ask the questions of why we need the information advertisements here. So we uh, list two application example here. The first one is to avoid the leak of the IFIX specific header and the mental data. So as we uh, uh, see here, so because the, 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 the IFIX spe specific header and the mental data uh, must be removed at the end of the uh, node. So uh, avoid, avoid the leak of the IFIX specific header, we need to know the end, uh, end node uh, have the iFit capability. So uh, this is the one case we uh, we need to uh, extend the IGP and uh, or the BGPS uh, protocol to advertise this information. And uh, the second uh, application we mentioned here, uh, as we know, the iFit uh, option types have different encapsulation format and uh, uh, different processing uh, procedure. Um, uh, we, we, we also list here two examples. The one uh, is the trace option types. And, and the uh, list type, we, we can see that uh, they ex expect the uh, to be the impact the tracing data can be uh, collected at every IOM transit node, uh, and uh, the data can be uh, ex uh, uh, processed at every uh, transit node. So, uh, for this case, we want to know the transit node, uh, whether it supports the trace option types. Uh, uh, capability. So this is uh, another sign of the example here. Uh, we, we, we want to answer the question why uh, we need to 
advertise uh, IFIT information. Next, uh, please. I have a comment here to say, see, uh, from yeah, Cisco. Please. So, so you would have to, you would have to, to use the information from all the routers. You would have to compute the same path if you're using, you know, best path routing, or if you're using some other kind. You'd have to compute that path to know, in fact, that all the transit nodes had the capability. Yes, um, actually. Uh, for example, uh, we can look at the second example. Uh, if we, uh, if we, our our intent to enable a a kind of uh, IFIT option types uh, to a specific uh, route uh, routing or uh, or the SR V6 routing, we need uh, we need to know the the head node and the end node uh, has the same namespace and the same option types they support to avoid the leak of the IFIT header. As second, uh, the in the middle in, in the middle node, I mean the traded node, if we choose the trace, tracing option types, I mean the IOM tracing option types, uh, for this time, exactly. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, you went through that before. What I'm saying, yeah, is yeah, yeah. You, you have to know, you have to know the exact path. So you'd have to compute the same path as the IGP. You'd have to know the path that it's going to, that it's going to take, to know for the transit information to be any, any, uh, of any use. We can take this off. I'll send the comment to the list. Uh, okay. okay, thank you. Uh, we can continue to discuss in this problem. Okay, uh, for this page, uh, we we give the definition of the IFIT node capability information format. So uh, in this draft, we consider uh, five uh, categories of the option types, uh, including the tracing, uh, uh, directly export uh, and uh, the EAM option type. So, uh, as we said, the, the IFIT option types uh, and uh, have the uh, relationship uh, uh, with the namespace identifier uh, because the namesp namespace identifier allowing devices to uh, determine whether the IFIT option types uh, it should be. Uh, processed. So uh, uh, we can see this figure. We we define the for uh, node capability information format has two uh, fields. The one is the namespace identifier, and another one is the type option uh, uh, option type enable flag. Uh, yeah, this is the uh, capability information for format. So. Uh, next, please. So, yeah, um, based on the definition of the node capability, uh, I mean the, the the field we need to include the information we we want to advertise uh, in the uh, IGP and the BGP. Uh, so, here uh, in uh, in this drops we. Uh, take advantage of the uh, uh, OSPF and ECs and the BGPLs uh, uh, because they, they also define the uh, LSA uh, of uh, TLB uh, to advertise uh, uh, some uh, router capability information uh, in this uh, routing domain. So we extend uh, a new I think not capability tier ways to uh, advertise this information. So here we list the uh, this tier uh, for each of the uh, protocols. Next, please. Okay, that is all the uh, content. Uh, 
uh, I, I mentioned in the short uh, comments are very calm. Thank you. Zimbin, why don't you go before me? Sure. Sorry, I can you hear me? Yes. Okay. okay. Chris, I think you can you can first. <laughs> okay. Do you want to talk as the working group chair? No, I don't <laughs> okay, you remember. Please. Uh, so yeah, I, I sent a couple things on the list on this because uh, this is definitely getting into the territory I think of advertising application stuff in IGPs. Um, I realize that the telemetry is you know related to the IGP function, but lots of things are related to the IGP function, you know, in that sort of sense. Um, I, I I mean, my suggestion is if I was if I was like uh, Trying to make this work with operators, I would just implement it. I mean, you don't even need to change any protocols. You just write a Yang model, and you already have the information from from the topology and what what your routers are. You know, you don't you don't actually need this capability stuff advertised in IGPs. You know, IS, ISOs, PF, BGP. You don't need to do any of that. You could you could literally deploy this today. Just you deploy a Yang model. And and so I think that there's like maybe a, a first step wrong, right? Like the, the first step was to assume that this was the right way to do it. And now the justification is, you know, this is really useful stuff. Well, yes, I think it's very useful stuff. I think the telemetry data is very, you know, useful and important. So I, I'm, my comments are never uh, and have not been directed at whether this is useful or not. It's just whether advertising application availability in the IGP is correct. Um, and to that, even if the working group decides that it is, I think I think we at least need as a working group, and I'm saying this as a working group member, but I think we need to use GenApp. I mean, this this is definitely what GenApp was written for, for advertising non-routing stuff in the IGPs or in ISIS at least. And that's my comments. Thanks. Uh, uh, thank you, Christine. I, I saw your comment in the email list. And uh, I think, uh, yes, I think net, uh, net comp young and uh, it's another valid way, as I mentioned in the email list, and to configure the capability, I think, and uh, uh, export the capability. But uh, let, uh, let us think another way. If we, we w want to uh, dispute a SR uh, routing uh, based on the PCAP or BGP. Why not? We 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 could be use the mm, the same protocol to to get or to collect uh, signaling this node capability, and we we then ca calculate uh, this uh, routing. Sure. I mean, this is one thing that when I was thinking about this, I, I specifically thought that's why I mentioned the wrong first step, right? I mean, if, if you start by doing everything in routing protocols, then it's sort of natural to keep keep going and keep doing things in routing protocols. And what I was saying is, could, could you step back and say, why does this need to be in routing protocols at all? And maybe it's not so obvious that these capabilities should be in there. But anyway. Hey. I'm in the, I think I'm the only one in the queue, right? I'm a, I'm a first. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I'm I'm not looking at the whole thing. Oh yeah, I guess I guess they're. Yeah. So Christian, so you done? Uh, so it's my turn. Yes, it's Robin. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Christian. In fact, I have two comments. Uh, so the first comments is related to your comments. Uh, from my point of view, we know that the MSD information is uh, advertised by IGP. So I think that uh, we we know that the I, I don't think this the IFIT is uh, application information because this IFIT this uh, in situ OEM we can also see uh, uh, 
uh, attributes belong to a specific SR path because it will check this the uh, performance of the SR path. So I think when calculated the calculated the SR path, we also uh, we also to specify if the uh, in situ OM is can be done for the SR path with the SR policy. When we calculate this information, we need to collect this information from this the network node to understand the capability. Or else the in situ OM functionality will be filled for this uh, SR path. So from this point of view, I still think this the uh, F8 capability is still is the path attributes. So I, I don't think can I, you, a, can I ask you a quick clarifying question on that? Are you saying that you will change routing based on the availability of of uh, the OA the this IFIT capability? Uh, I will not change this the I will not change this the uh, the maybe not change the path, but I think if I understand the capability. I can download the SR, uh, download the SR policy with this IFIT, uh, IFIT capability. Uh, because you know, I will enable this the IFIT uh, functionality for specific SR path. But if this the nodes along the SR path, if some nodes cannot support IFIT, so this the IFIT, uh, this the IFIT the detection for the SR path will be filled. So I need so, so, I mean, dude, so basically that I think my the answer is is where I'm looking for the difference, right? If if you were saying I'm going to route traffic differently based on whether I can trace it, I think that then you start talking about you're making routing decisions based on this information and then, then it might belong in the routing protocol. But if you're not modifying routing, then it's something that's sitting above, right? It's 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 a layer of I see. Yeah, so Christian, I think the the routing is this the one hand, but you know the traffic engineering, I think this is still this the IDP is the main major functionality. I think that's belong to the traffic engineering. Right, but the, then routing decisions are being made based on traffic engineering information, right? <laughs> I I Okay, I, I think this uh, we can go have more discussion in the main list. Okay. Yeah, this is the first comment. So the second comment, uh, I, I'm not sure this is the process of this is the, uh, the 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 draft because the I say that's the SS OSPF uh, in one draft. I, I think it's okay, but I don't know why the BGP link state is also in the draft. I I I don't think this is the this is not the Traditional way. I can answer that. This is as a chair. Um, the, the, it's the that's the agreement we have with IDR. Uh, I think it's too early. <laughs> well, I mean, the LS is just carrying the information, right? So it was it's sort of natural. Oh, okay. If you think this is to help understand all at once, I think it's okay. But. Uh, I think this is because this is just an individual draft is too early to to do this way, maybe. Can I, can I just jump in as as a IDR co chair since uh, we we've spiraled off in that direction? Sure, John. Go ahead. Uh, just with with regards to you know. Um, individual versus working group draft. I mean, presumably every individual draft that's being presented at any working group is, you know, the authors hope for it to become a working group draft. So if you think the ultimate uh, stage is to have it be a working group draft, then, you know, go ahead and guide your individual draft in that direction. Um, I, I don't think it's too early to to put it into the form that you would want it to appear in the working group. Thank you. Sorry for jumping the queue. Mm. Okay, I, I I don't think uh, I don't think this uh, uh, this is not uh, uh, acceptable. But I I don't think this uh, is a traditional way. Uh, yeah. Okay. No problem. 
Okay, I guess hey, AC, I, you're up. Yep. I guess I'd like to say as I looked at this, and as long as the information is just the namespace and capabilities. I don't have that much problem with it being in the, it, on a node level being advertised as a first step then going into either BGPLS and then the rest of all these, I'm not familiar with all these uh, o, OAM uh, tracing and performance measurement, at least I've heard of them all, but I, haven't, I, I'm, I don't know the details. But if we start putting other types of information, then it's, that's, that's too much. This would be just to know if you could initiate uh initiate further uh connections with that node and start start up some of those possibly query and get more information and then start up a trace or a performance measurement so i have less of a problem with that is that um, as a working group member as a working group member yes and as the offer of 7770 the ospf capability it, uh, yeah, we definitely. Uh, I think ISI as an OSPF have had a slightly different before we merged as working groups. We maybe had different levels of things, but yeah, I, yeah, I believe I believe you're right. Uh, and the next up is Jeff Sincero. Hey, uh, so uh, I'm close to Chris' position here. Leaking management plane information, control plane is not a good idea. Uh, I don't think the capability advertisement would be used to actually pass establishment because besides capabilities, you also need to configure things. So you would need configuration channel anyway, to configure namespaces and other options. So it just doesn't make sense to discover things. You need to configure them afterwards anyway. So I really don't see a reason for the staff to be in AGPs. And comparison to MSD is really incorrect. MSD is directly used for constrained pass computations by PC. This information is in no way used in computations. It's just for information. That's my point, pretty much. Yeah, I, I, I agree that it's not the same as MSD, and I made that point on the list as well. Not copper. Uh, G, you're up next on the mic. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, so I'd like to uh, maybe mention another uh, use case of uh, advertising the, some capability information, which is a uh, seamless BFD. I think uh, uh, although the seamless BFD can be used for the IGP for the liveness detection, but it can also be used for multi hubs uh, pass detection. So this is uh, maybe this capability is not that uh, directly related to the uh, pass computation or the routing. Um, that's all. But, you, but your first, but you did say that it has to do with adjacencies, right? So. Yeah, that is one use case, but there are also yeah. other use cases. Right, but the fact that there's one use case where it relates to path computation, right, and routing decisions. Okay, anyway, sorry to jump into the queue. Yeah, just to mention this. Rakesh. Uh, hi, uh, so um, I just wanted to um, uh, highlight one use case for SRMPLS. Um, so uh, the NCAP node adds the MPLS um, uh, header uh, for IOM and DCAP node uh, removes it. So, in order for the NCAP node to know that DCAP node is uh, capable of uh, processing IOM or removing the um, uh, uh, header, um, uh, otherwise the packets will be uh, will be dropped. Right. So, uh, so that's one requirement. Um, that's uh, there is a draft for it and stuff. So I'm not proposing this as a solution, but I'm just saying that there is one requirement for SRMPLS for NCAP node to know the DCAP is capable of uh, processing it. Uh, I, I think the, 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 the cap, this capability should be, uh, can be uh, advertised by the IGP protocol, because if you configure it, if you configure this information why the netconf or yeah uh, on one device the other device cannot know the 
capability. So it cannot decide whether uh, whether it can use uh, uh, IFA. So uh, you know, okay. So I think uh, 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 in in the main list the list has provided uh, other way to transfer such information. That is why why the app level. Uh, uh, Transfer. So I think uh, uh, either either option can be used, but I think it, it is should be transferred by the IT protocol. Okay. So I'm in the queue behind you, but I I would say I I don't I don't understand that. Like you you certainly could query anything you want with Yang, right? And you can and there's a capabilities directly built into it. So the, the transport is there. I mean, the, the, it's not a the IGPs don't have to be used as a transport to query routers on their capabilities. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. And that made me forget what I was going to. There was in the comment I had for Rakesh, but I forgot it. And that's me as a working monitor. <coughs> oh, the end cap. Yeah, that was what I was going to. Right. Something is computing these paths, right? So I mean. The, the the end cap, you know, to turning these features on and off and configuring them, you have you have to query capabilities to know that you can do that, right? It doesn't again, it doesn't have to be advertised in the IGP. It's just really easy, you know. And I'll I'll put my chair hat on for a minute. It's really easy if you have a little bit of information that you want your network to know to say, hey. Let's throw it in the IGP, right? Because and and you know, having been chair for a while, I've seen these presentations many times, right? And and because it's so easy to say, let's just throw it in the IGP, and it'll get distributed, and we're done. Uh, and so there's a real, you know, people often think that that's a great idea, and we had a lot of pushback in the past in ISIS, and we even wrote a, a and published work as a working group called GenApp. To specifically take all these wants and move them out of the main routing protocol instance. So this is this is not a new ask. It's just the one that we've we've pushed back against for many many years. I, I think this uh, question. I think now that there are not many protocols can be used. So, uh, Chris, um, yeah, um, for SRMPLS, uh, we can use uh, PCAP uh, to um, ingress or NCAP to know the capability of the egress or decap node. That was Rakesh, that was Rakesh again, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I, I guess we should take this to the list. This is AC speaking as co-chair. Also, is that is uh, the other thing that is is going to be interesting with this work is whether this whole IFIT uh, framework gets adopted in the uh, management work, uh, whatever it is, the OEM MG MG group, right? You're presenting that there when they do have an interim. That's yeah. Uh, yeah, um, and uh, I, I think uh, I, I thought uh, another scenarios, uh, it has a different uh, between the NETCOM uh, and the existing uh, protocols. So, so may, may I, uh, can we think of uh, this scenario that if we, uh, uh, if the uh, topo topology of network, uh, Dynamic changing, so maybe use the uh, IGP and BGP protocol to to collect the uh, changing of the node as the fast. I mean the efficient way to 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 know the the changing and the capability of nodes. If if have the new no uh, if have a new uh, devices uh, uh, join in the network and the, Leave. Uh, I think that use the the protocol is the efficient way to collect this information. 
you're saying you need to deal with routers coming and going at a microsecond level? Uh, yes, I, I thought that as an example. So that, this is AC again. That wasn't my question, but I, the statement I was making again is the framework being adopted in the ops area working group would be a sort of that would be that would have to come before us putting you know considering this for the IGPs and and for BGPLS the framework document right uh sorry uh I okay uh hello this is Robin uh okay I, I understand your point yeah but now that's the this is the I think uh, this is the task uh, we we will discuss this uh, uh, I think framework and uh, uh, this protocol extension in the OPSA WG. Uh, and also this uh, I, I I understand your point, but now this also depend on this the uh, OPSA WG is the, the working group's opinion on the on the draft of the I think framework. Yeah, because that's the informational. I'm not sure the uh, you know now that the uh, IETF has some this opinion on the framework job. So uh, I will uh, if we have this information, we will exchange the to uh, exchange the uh, in the LSI working group. Yeah, I I also think I think it's a I don't think it was incorrect to bring this to the LSI working group because we, it's also our job to provide feedback to the ops right to say that. If, in fact, the working group doesn't like this information um, going into the protocol, then that's important information for them to have, right? And mm -hmm. when they make decisions about the framework. But I mean, I'm not saying, you know, I'm just speaking as a working group member on my opinions on whether it should go in. But certainly as, as a chair, we want to be informing ops about what our opinions are about using the protocol in the first mm -hmm. place. But um, AC, we might need to move on. I don't know. I think we should move on. I I, I thought. We've, okay, the last one is. Okay. Uh, G. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, AC. Okay. Thank you. Hello. Okay. Let me start. Okay. So this is uh, a. IGP extensions about the segment routing based uh, VPN, and we are presenting an update of the existing draft and also uh, to simplify the solution which is specified in the uh, zero version. So, here are some backgrounds. First, uh, the VPN Plus framework uh, is described in the IT uh, TIS enhanced VPN draft, which is a working group document. It describes a uh, layered architecture and uh, the candidate technologies in each layer to together enable the enhanced VPN service. And the virtual transport network is, has a virtual entry network in the VPN Plus architecture. And for the SR-based VPN Plus, we have this mechanism and data plane extensions def uh, defined in the spring SR4 enhanced VPN draft. Basically, basically, it uh, defines mechanism to associate the SRCs with uh, a different set of resources in the network for the packet processing. And so that this kind of a resource aware seeds could be used to build the resource guaranteed virtual networks or virtual paths. Um, it also described the mechanism for the creation and the, the packet forwarding in the SR based virtual networks. So for these documents, uh, we uh, want to define the IGP uh, protocol mechanisms and the necessary extensions to support this SR based VPN plus uh, so that IGP can be used to distribute the required information in the network and also to the controller. And we try to reuse existing protocol mechanisms uh, to build a basic or simplified solution. And in addition, we also provide a flexible and scalable solution with some more additional uh protocol extensions okay next slide please okay here are some uh, terminologies first uh, the vpn plus uh, we think uh, the vpn plus 
It's a kind of uh, enhanced VPN service, uh, which uh, additional commitments such as the enhanced isolation or performance guarantee. And another term is uh, called virtual transport network or VTN. And basically a VTN is a virtual underlay network that connects the customer sites uh, with the capability of providing the additional uh, commitment like the isolation performance characteristics, which are required by the service customer. So a VTN uh, is built with a customized topology and a set of other dedicated or shared network resources. So we can see the relationship between the VPN plus and VTN and the physical network. I think the VPN plus is provided based on the integration uh, between the overlay VPN and the underlay virtual transfer network or VTN. So a VTN can provide the as a underlay for one or a group of VPN plus services. So this is the relationship between these terms. Okay, next slide. Okay, here uh, we'll uh, briefly talk about the, the mechanism we proposed in this uh, IRSR SRVTN MT draft. Uh, this draft uh, describes how to use the multi topology and the existing ISS TLVs or sub TLVs to advertise the attributes of a VTN. Uh, in this draft, we reuse the MT ID as the control plane identifier of a VTN and the multi topology ISS mechanism is used for, used for the topology advertisement. Then we can use the ISS segment routing extensions to advertise the um, MPRCs or SRV6 locators or Cs uh, at the uh, topology level. In addition, we also uh, consider to advertise the topology uh, TE attributes for each VTN. For example, we need to advertise the bandwidth for reserved for each topology on a specific link. In this case, we can reuse the maximum link bandwidth of TLV, uh, but uh, since one link can participate in multiple topologies, so in this case, we we don't need we should not advertise the physical link bandwidth for each topology on. Uh, we should advertise maybe a subset uh, of the link resource bandwidth for a specific topology and the, the sum of this, all this bandwidth for all the topologies on one link will be the physical link bandwidth. Uh, another uh, uh, mechanism is we can advertise the association of the MTID with the bundle member links in a layer two bundle. Uh, I think we, re uh, we re uh, received some comments from mail list, and uh, actually we also consider the air two bundle and can be generalized to describe either the physical member links or the virtual member links. So it is can should it is not uh, necessarily for it to be a layer two uh, physical member link. Next slide, please. Okay, this uh, we summarize some comments and discussion on the list for about this draft. Uh, the first one is, uh, should we, this document be a standard track or informational document? Uh, my understanding is we are cur currently, we are open to this uh, kind of question because we, firstly, we want to uh, figure out whether we should specify something which are not uh, existing in the existing RFCs or we want whether we need some uh, small extensions to make this uh, work. The first is uh, about uh, how to carry the T attributes at a topology level. Uh, we know that the INA registry shows, shows it is allowed, but uh, the multi topology RFC is not very clear about this because it says that the traffic engineering may be applied uh, in future or uh, later. Um, then if this, they are allowed, another question comes like uh, I just mentioned in the previous slide, we need to further specify uh, how to advertise the topology specific attributes, when, especially when one link participates in multiple topologies. This is something maybe not exist in the existing uh, RFCs and maybe for some specific attributes we need to uh, 
specify how to split it uh, for different topologies, and while for some other T attributes, maybe uh, the attributes for the physical link should be shared or reused by the topology uh, attributes. Okay, uh, then another question is, can the multi-topology ID be associated with the little bundle member links? We got the feedback from the mail list that uh, the answer is no. People think MTID is like uh, layer three construct. Uh, you know, in this case, we uh, we think the layer three parent link of the layer two bundle bundles it uh, need to participate in multiple multiple and want to specify which um, uh, subset of the T attributes. Uh, on this uh, layer three link is uh, reserved or allocated to a particular topology of ETN. We need, we can, we maybe we can reuse or generalize the layer two bound mechanism for this. And the extensions are specified in the uh, next slide. Okay, this one. Uh, uh, similar to the multi topology based mechanism, we also proposed a draft on the flux algo based mechanism. This is about how to use flux algo and some small extensions to level two bundle to uh, advertise the VTN attributes. But in this case, the flux algo identifier is reused as a control plane ID of the VTN, and the flux algo is used to define the topology constraints. IGPSR mechanism for flux algo can be used to the, the algorithm specific uh, prefixes or SRV sticks locator of seeds. Uh, the other uh, uh, the extension to in this uh, draft is we need to extend the little bundle to advertise the T attributes associated with its each flux algo or VDN. So we need to we define a new flag in the little bundle attribute. Uh, which is the called a V flag. Uh, when it is set, it indicates that the member links of this layer bundle are virtual links. They're not the layer two, layer two physical members. So we can generalize the layer two bundle for the T attributes advertisement and also the association uh, to associate a specific uh, virtual or physical member link with a flux algo. This is uh, the extension for this draft. For the other part of this uh, draft, just try to reuse existing flux algo mechanisms. Okay, mm, next slide. So in the previous two uh, proposals, the mechanism uh, can provide a simplified uh, solution while there are some constraints like uh, the numbers of a uh, Flux algos or number of the topologies are limited. And also, if we want to achieve more flexible combination of these different attributes to build a, a required uh, underlay, uh, we think uh, we need a more flexible and scalable solution. So, this is uh, proposed in this uh, RSR, SR enhanced VP draft. So, basically, in this draft, we give a multi dimension definition to VTN. Uh, VTN is defined as a combination of uh, several attributes, uh, including the topology, uh, resource, or other optional attributes, which can be introduced uh, later. Uh, in this case, uh, VTN uh, reference a topology uh, so that different VTNs can reference to the same topology. And also, similarly, the resource attributes can be shared by multiple VTNs on particular uh, network nodes or links. In, in this draft, we also try to decouple the advertisement and processing of different attributes so that for different attributes, we can reuse the protocol, existing protocol mechanisms if possible. And it can also reduce the overhead. We can re reuse some information when this uh, components is shared by uh, multiple VTNs. So that uh, the overhead in advertisement and, and in computation can be reduced. Okay, next slide. Okay, this is the definition of the VTN. Uh, basically, we need 
uh, introduce a new sub TLV in the ISS router capability uh, TLV to advertise the relationship between the VTN ID and the topology ID and other optional attributes. So the MT ID uh, is a 16-bit six, identifier and the algorithm is a 8-bit identifier to identify either a normal algorithm or the flux algorithm. We can also introduce the sub TRVs in the future if needed. Slide. Okay. Uh, for the topology attributes advertisement, we can reuse the either multi topology or flux algo because both are can be referenced in the definition of the VTN. And as mentioned before, both mechanisms can advertise the topology from the topology specific seeds or locators and the MTR can also support to advertise topology specific attributes. So this can, two mechanisms can be considered as options for the topology information uh, advertisement. Well, we may also consider to combine the multi-topology with uh, some algorithms uh, when it is needed or considered useful. Here, uh, another thing we want to mention here is uh, one topology or one flux algo could be referenced by multiple VTNs so that with the number of VTNs can be more than the topologies of flux algos uh, in the network. Okay, next slide. Okay, for the resource attribute advertisement here, uh, similar to the Flasago draft, uh, Flasago extension draft, we extended the L2 bundle TLV to advertise the attributes, T attributes of uh, either a virtual member link or the physical member link. In addition, we in introduced a new VTN ID sub TLV to describe the mapping between the VTNs and the member links. Uh, basically, one member link can be associated with one or multiple VTNs. So this sub TLV will be carried in the little bundle member uh, attribute sub um, TLV. Okay, next slide. Okay, uh, in addition to the advertisement of the topology and the resource information, uh, we also introduced the mechanism to advertise the VTN specific data plane IDs, identifiers. Uh, for the SRMPRS, we need to in advertise the VTN specific prefixes, uh, VTN specific adjacency seeds. TLVs will be similar to the existing uh, seeds sub TLVs with uh, additional VTN ID field. For the SRV6, we can introduce the, uh, the VTN specific SRV6 locators. Um, and here we also mentioned another uh, data plane mechanism, which is we can uh, consider to introduce a dedicated VTN ID in the data plane, so that the data plane VTN ID can be the same as the, the VTN ID we carried in the control plane protocols. Here we, we have an optional encapsulation defined in the draft mentioned here, which is to use the, the extension headers in the uh, IPv6 to carry the VTN ID field. Okay, next slide. Okay, so in summary, we think the VTN here uh, provides the required virtual underlay network to support the VPN plus services. Uh, this is uh, the uh, meaning of the VTN. And the, the uh, multi-topology of Las Algo-based mechanisms, uh, basically they are the combination of the existing TLVs and we try to reuse existing uh, encodings as much as possible. Well, some additional specification or extensions may be needed to fulfill the required features. Um, in the last, uh, we also propose a, a flexible and a scalable solution, which is uh, to meet some specific requirements, but uh, the, the protocol extensions will be more than the previous two uh, solutions in either the control plane or the data plane. Okay, next slide. Okay.
is for the next steps, we, we would like to hear the feedbacks uh, on this, the proposals and uh, whether some of this can need to be refined and how we can move forward. Okay, that's all for my- Tarek on the mic. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Uh, Hi, this is Tarek from, Jen from Juniper Networks. <clears throat> I have a question on the um, VTN ID and the multi-topology ID. Uh, what is the, uh, is there a direct relationship between the two or uh, are they the same? Or they, uh, that's question number one. And question number two is about the VTN ID again. Is it global in the network? Is it inter-domain global? Okay. Okay. For the uh, first question, uh, I think for different we we has three we have three proposed proposals here for the multi topology based mechanism the VTN ID is uh, we think they should reuse the existing multi topology ID as an identifier in the control plane. So there's there's one to one mapping between the VTN and the multi topology. For the flux algo, it is similar. We try to reuse the flux algo ID to uh, identify the VTN in the control plane so that it also uses one to one mapping. For the third mechanism, we allow uh, end to one mapping between the VTN ID and the uh, multi topology ID or the flux algo ID so that this is more flexible and we can, um, we don't need to. We constrain away the, the uh, space of the, either the flux algo ID or the multi topology ID. The VTN ID can be, as we defined here, it can, has a larger space. This is uh, for the question one. Uh, for the question two, uh, the VTN ID is a global identifier. Uh, if uh, possible, we can be uh, global, so significant across multiple domains, so that it can be used as a global ID for the multi domain uh, VTN. Well, in each domain, you can reference to different flasago uh, mm, or multi topology. So this is can help you to build a multi domain, multi -domain uh, scenario. I, I understand. So, so keep in mind, uh, multi uh, MTID. I think it's an IGP construct or IGP ID. So, given that you're saying that they're one to one, uh, you need to make it into domain. So usually IGP IDs are reusable across domains. Huh? Yeah, yeah. If you use the, like the multi topology based mechanism, you, there's some constraints like the one to one mapping. And also, if you use it for inter domain, it requires the, the multi topology ID in different domains are the same. Some constraints, but uh, with the, the third uh, solution, this is more flexible on this part. Thanks. Okay, Tony, Pete. All right, all on mutes, I think, done. Um, so, uh, so first observation. So this L2 bundle thing is kind of a, um, you know, uh, orange striped herring here. Uh, by all means, just run enough L3s, okay? Rather than trying to like make this L2 look like L3s. The real problem, I think, is semantic, and uh, the comment is, I mean, I attribute that to less, but I'm thinking precisely the same thing. Uh, it is not clear what is the semantics if you have multiple topologies or whatever flex out, which are kind of harder to you know, figure out because they just wander around, but you know, multi-topology is very static, like I know the link is in this topology, it doesn't go away. Um, what does it mean when you advertise over multiple topologies, uh, traffic engineering attributes, right? What, what is it? Each of them gets a slice, they kind of influence each other, you, you know, so, so they're less racist stuff. So I think we have to define the semantics was what the key attribute means in case of multi topology, because it's a simple consideration. And then we can take the, all the arguments farther from there. And again, I think the L2 is a red herring. You just try to make L2, L3 again. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think you are right that we need to specify the meaning or semantics for uh, the per topology 
talk about topology specific T attributes and uh, how we define how to define them for the yeah. specific scenario. Right, I think this is really dependent on encoding on which technology you're using. You know, how what is the resource sharing that IGP is advertising here across these abstractions? And then we figure out the encoding, you know, and maybe we put in two or we put in only one or whatever. And the L2, I would postpone even farther because it's just an optimization. Okay. Think about it. Thank you. Okay, that's the end of the queue. Uh, it's also the end of the presentations. Um, I, I guess I have a couple things to just note before we end, and then maybe AC does too. Uh, we have an interim coming up, a uh, second interim to discuss uh, the flooding parameters and flood scaling. Um, the, we have a couple of different um, approaches to address that issue. And um, we have it in a separate slot. Uh, well, one, because we run out of time in this one, but also um, to have a sort of open discussion that maybe, you know, might be different from the mailing list, then maybe we can make some more progress there uh, between the two drafts and see if we can come up with something we more get rough consensus basically um, on what a good way forward is. Uh, I was hoping that the ICCRG was going to meet on the 13th. Chris, because, Chris? Yeah. You, you didn't put the context, you mean the area proxy and TTZ? No. Oh, okay. No, the flooding, the flood, the flooding parameters, Bruno and Les's. Oh, those two drafts. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, anyway, I was going to say we could, as homework, as a working group, we could go to the ICCRG meeting, which is the, you know, congestion control research group. Uh, but I, they, they're not, it doesn't seem like they have an interim going. But my point in that was that the stuff can be kind of hard, right, to get right, at least when you want to do it dynamically. But, um, yeah, anyway, uh, so we have that meeting coming up. It should be interesting. Um, and, and then AC, uh, please sign the blue sheets. Uh, if you haven't signed the blue sheets yet, we have 58, we were up to 64. I hope we have 64 people on there. Um, and yeah, I don't have anything else, AC. Yeah, I put, I put, I put it one last time in the chat, the uh, link to the blue sheet. Tony, did you just put a queue for the white queue? Yeah, I mean, with, uh, since we talk about this resource stuff, um, uh, I, I think there's even a more profound uh, discussion here. Once you go to the level of complexity like this VPN plus, which does, you know, multidimensional resource management across lots of abstraction, uh, is it even wise to stuff all the stuff into the IGP? Isn't then really a role for something like a provisioning system, you know, in terms of a controller, something centralized that, that counts all these resources? we may be ill served to try to you know to start to do multi-dimensional advertisement of all these resource management one can argue right if the dynamic enough igp is the right thing but really oh that's a comment after my own heart but <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, ac did you do you want to have any last words N I think I think you said it. Uh, I'm going. The, the other thing, like I said at the beginning, I'm going to add the uh, document status to the uh, agenda for the, the the meeting in two weeks. Yeah. Right. Good. Thank. That, that's good. I I wanted to mention a couple of drafts, but I'll wait until till then. We we managed to have a agenda take up three hour slot. Yep. <laughs> We didn't hurry anybody, so that was that was good. It took me three. Okay. It took me at least three presentations to figure out how to use both computers <laughs> on one and use the chat on the uh, chat and the uh, uh, on the other. Okay, everybody. Well, thank you, and uh, hope to see you at the next one. Uh, yep. And stay, Thanks, and stay and home and stay safe. Yep. Bye. Thanks, everyone.